Hello, my fellow Nightcrawlers, and welcome to a brand new video. As usual, grab your blankets and grab your snacks and get comfortable, because today we're going to be looking into the case of Daniel Pelka. I usually try to keep my videos very, like, almost lighthearted in a way, but this one is very grim and very dark. So don't expect too many jokes in this one. It's going to be just straight delivery of the information because the contents within this one are, are very heavy. So be aware of that as we go in. It's been over 10 years since the tragic death of a four-year-old boy happened in Coventry, England. Before we get into that, though, let's take a look from the beginning. It's the 15th of July in 2007, and a lady named Magdalena Luchak gives birth to a beautiful baby boy. The father, Eric Pelka, is excited as he holds his second child. Meet Daniel Pelka. For the most part, the first year of Daniel's life was rather normal. However, Magdalena started to show signs of aggression within the relationship. This would lead to a lot of fights between Eric and Magdalena. Magdalena would shout at Eric, and Eric would say names back, and it was this constant chain of fighting that, in all honesty, seemed like they were just feeding off of each other's anger. It's even been reported that Magdalena would actually go out of her way to try and attack Eric, basically physically assaulting him. One night, the two got drunk and had a fight, and Magdalena grabbed a knife. The toxic relationship ended in 2008. Eric had told his brother that they had separated, quote, when I'd found out she had cheated on me with one of my mates, end quote. Eric left the country for work in Poland shortly after the separation, leaving young Daniel with Magdalena. In 2012, Magdalena found a new partner, an old Polish friend named Marius. It was at this point that Daniel's life would forever be changed. Magdalena was a cleaner and worked at a local parcel force depot, and Marius was a person who had served in the army a few years prior. He was an ex-convict who worked in a local automotive plant and would often boast about his prior jail time to his co-workers. Marius had been discharged from the army after attacking a recruit. From the get-go, it was very clear that Marius did not like Daniel. Marius would constantly tell his co-workers that Daniel was R-worded and autistic, despite never even being diagnosed. While Marius's co-workers heard his frustrations, they never realized what was going on behind closed doors. Magdalena and Marius drank a lot. They were hardcore alcoholics, and they constantly neglected Daniel. Marius even hoped that Daniel's biological father would just swoop in and take him to Poland. Eric unfortunately never took custody of Daniel though. This was due to a very limited financial situation. I do would like to believe though that Eric would have taken Daniel in had he known what was going on behind closed doors. You see, Marius and Magdalena were mishandling and beating Daniel daily. Daniel lived in a home filled with alcohol and violence. As a child who was simply trying to make it through each day, anything that either Daniel did, or might have even been Magdalena's fault, or Marius's fault, anything that could potentially have punishment was eventually brought upon Daniel, for no good reason. Along with being beaten, the couple would also starve Daniel and make him do very rigorous and intensive exercises to deplete his energy. While it is unclear whether or not Magdalena did abuse her child in the previous relationship with Eric, it definitely became apparent that some sort of abuse was happening when she entered the relationship with Marius. The first real sign of abuse came in 2010, when a health advisor noticed that there was a bruise on Daniel's head. The parents, of course, brushed the situation off, said, oh, Daniel had fallen down. Of course, giving the parents the benefit of the doubt the first time it happens is fair. They didn't realize the extent of the abuse. But as years began to pass by, there were many different signs that Daniel was being abused. Many people had questioned and almost ridiculed the people that were around Daniel's life, saying, how did you not see these signs? How did nothing come of this? Why couldn't these things have been prevented? Some news outlets said Daniel was a, quote, four-year-old who was invisible to authorities, end quote. And that, quote, police, social workers, doctors, and teachers failed to save Daniel, end quote. A few months later, the police were called on reports of domestic violence happening within the household. Marius had cut Magdalena and strangled her until she was unconscious. 
This started a trend where the police were called multiple times, enough so that concerns about the history of domestic abuse incidents at the family home prompted an in-depth assessment. A further 30 reports of domestic violence calls were made in the following two years. Daniel, just being three years old at this time, had no idea what to do. It was on January 6th of 2011 when Daniel would be taken to the emergency services. When being checked into the hospital, it was reported that Daniel sustained fractures to his left arm, multiple bruises to the arm, left shoulder, and stomach. And you're not going to believe what the parents claimed had happened. The parents had said that, oh, Daniel fell off the couch. Daniel was due for a follow-up a month later on his arm. Despite this, though, Magdalena didn't take him. She just didn't take him to get him checked up on his fractured arm. Daniel's social service investigation file would be closed a month later, despite showing clear signs of an abusive home and an abusive environment. At this point, Daniel was starving at home and sustaining brutal beatings by the hands of Marius. Teachers also began to notice Daniel behaving in very odd ways. He would cower and almost look away when male teachers were around, and most importantly, he was constantly fatigued. In addition to all of this, Daniel was losing a lot of weight and would often eat the scraps other classmates had from their meals. Teachers had also began to notice that Daniel would eat an excessive amount of the free fruit that was provided by the schools. It would then be over the next few months that Daniel would experience immense amounts of starvation, and on top of this, still sustaining the beatings of Marius. While working at the auto shop, Marius would constantly complain about Daniel, saying that he woke him up in the middle of the night as he was raiding the fridge trying to get food. Marius would tell his workers that, quote, Daniel was a up person and sick in the head, end quote. He even went on to say that, quote, it's not even worth beating him because he won't feel pain as he's autistic, end quote. It was at the beginning of 2012 when the principal of Daniel's school came to Magdalena and Marius about Daniel. They set up a meeting and, interestingly enough, Marius did not show up. The principal had been notified that Daniel was digging through bins, barely interacted with the other students, and that he had became so frail from losing so much weight that he had practically sunken into his uniform. Staff members would claim that Daniel would, quote, look for food everywhere, and that he, quote, would eat whatever he could get his hands on. On a teacher's birthday, the teacher had actually brought in a cake so that way it could be shared amongst all the kids, and Daniel had eaten half of the cake. Teachers had noticed bruising around Daniel's neck and ears. There were also scratch marks by his eyes and scabs on his nose. In addition, one teacher also noted that there was a large bruise on Daniel's forehead, and on top of this, Daniel's eyes had reportedly sunken in so much due to a lack of sleep. Despite all of those signs, that was as far as it would be taken in terms of talking about what's been going on to Daniel. Social services didn't step in. There were no police reports filed. The police didn't even show up at their house. Nothing. Nothing. The farthest it went was a talk to the principals. If it already wasn't made clear enough, Magdalena and Marius had no desire to take care of Daniel. With so many signs of abuse, it is almost shocking that nothing happened to any of the people involved in the abuse of Daniel. Daniel was only four years old and his life was miserable. As if starvation and beatings weren't enough, Marius also removed the doorknob from Daniel's room and left him imprisoned in his room for days at a time. Daniel couldn't even leave the room to go to the bathroom. He had to basically do the deed in his room and then deal with it. And shockingly enough, Magdalena's household was spotless. Everything else looked so clean, except for Daniel's room, which was covered in feces. On the 10th of February in 2012, Daniel visited the pediatrician and was prescribed some worm tablets. The doctor admitted that Daniel, quote, appeared thin, but not wasting away. End quote. Daniel showed up to school a few days later with two black eyes. This alerted the teachers and was reported in the Concerns Book, 
though nothing further was done. Other teachers said that they had not noticed this. It was then the 1st of March of 2012, and Daniel's mother fetches him from school. The CCTV footage captures Magdalena collecting her child, and Daniel runs up behind to catch up to her. Unfortunately, this would be the last footage of Daniel. The next day, something happened, and Daniel wet himself. Out of frustration, Marius would inflict one final punishment on Daniel. Daniel was force-fed pure salt and then was told to basically squat while having to deal with all of the salt within his mouth and probably his stomach as he's ingesting it. Magdalena did Google searches for salt poisoning symptoms, child not responding, and care for a patient in a coma. Magdalena then messaged Marius about concerns over Daniel, to which he replied that he will get over it, and that there was no point in calling the ambulance because it would cause proper problems. 33 hours after the initial beating, Marius then called the ambulance on March 3rd at 3 o'clock. By 328, little Daniel was admitted to the hospital, and it was clear that he had suffered from cardiac arrest. Unfortunately, Daniel would not be resuscitated. At 350, Daniel, being four years old and seven months, was pronounced dead. The autopsy would report 22 injuries, 10 of which were direct hits to Daniel's head. When he was weighed, Daniel was only 22.93 pounds, or roughly 10.4 kilograms. This is nearly half the average weight of what he should have been. 22.93 pounds is usually the weight associated with an 18-month-old child, not a four-year-old boy, or a near five-year-old boy. It was later reported that Magdalena and Marius had sex moments before the ambulance arrived, as if they had prepared for what was to come. They had sex again on the evening of the arrest, two days later. However, Magdalena claimed that Marius had assaulted her, so take that as you will. The investigating officer was disgusted to find 15 cases in which Daniel's death could have been prevented. When reviewing the 999 calls, the investigating officer had this to say. I've listened to a lot of 999 calls over the years because a basic line of inquiry when a child has died is to listen to the 999 tapes because you can hear some very significant comments in the background. Very often, you find that you can't understand what parents are saying because they are so anxious, they're screaming for help. This was very different because it was rather more calculated and sounded rather more coached. Straight away, I just felt, that's not true. That's been staged, if you like. Listen, my son, my son, he, he stopped breathing. He got four years, yeah? And I, and we wake up and he stopped, he stopped, he stopped breathing. He sent me... Okay, what's, some... he do, what's he doing now? Is he breathing? <laughs> no, he's not breathing. Okay. Nothing. All right, are you, are you right? He added that Daniel was badly let down, not just, quote, by an evil stepfather and an indifferent and selfish mother, end quote, but also by his school, health professionals, and social services. During the trial, it was clear that Marius had felt no guilt. After 17 hours in the witness box, he showed no signs of guilt. Interestingly enough though, at one point, Marius said that he would not have treated his own child the same way. When he was asked why he mistreated the boy, he answered with, quote, It happened because I wanted to satisfy Magda. You wanted to satisfy her? The district judge heavily ridiculed Marius's remarks about Daniel's autistic behaviors, claiming that, quote, It may be that he had some behavioral or communication difficulties, as you had constantly suggested. Though such difficulties as he had been in, my view, more likely to have been due to your abusive treatment of him, rather than to any other cause. Magdalena attempted to play the victim during her trial. Of course, Magdalena was everything far from a victim. She was an alcoholic and a hardcore drug user who did not care about Daniel. Something that's also very commonly associated with parents is you see them telling every little thing about their kid. But Magdalena had reportedly tried to keep Daniel a secret to anyone and everyone she had come across. Magdalena had said all throughout the trial that she was terrified of Marius. However, any time she was given a chance to get near Marius, she would caress him, hold his hand, 
all that stuff. Magdalena showed a lot more remorse than Marius did, which, I mean, isn't even saying much anyway. While both Magdalena and Marius denied causing Daniel's death, both did admit to counts of child cruelty. Marius Krezelik and Magdalena Lucek, the sentence for the crime of murder is fixed by law. It is one of life imprisonment, and that is the sentence I now impose upon each of you. Magdalena and Marius received a minimum of 30 year sentences. Neither of the two would serve the entire 30 years. On the 14th of July in 2015, Magdalena would hang herself in her prison cell. And then, a few months after that, Marius would suffer from a heart attack, both dying in jail. Daniel's body would only be buried a year and a half later. Eric Pelka wanted to hold a funeral for his child, but could not afford to fly Daniel's body over to Poland. Eventually, a funeral firm would donate the cost to Eric and Daniel's body would finally be buried on the 3rd of September in 2013. There's a Facebook page up to commemorate the life of Daniel. His trial gained a lot of attention and the community raised over 10,000 pounds to the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. There were multiple gatherings in the name of Daniel Pelka, as well as a failed petition to make it mandatory to report child abuse evidence. A year later, an indie rock band called Little Comets released a song called Salt, accompanied by a YouTube video dedicated to the memory of Daniel Pelka. The Justice for Daniel Pelka Facebook group is still active. Many people come to share their emotions on his case here. Often, people post about when they would visit Daniel's grave to show their care and remorse. A few months ago, the admin posted a video of Daniel's grave covered with flowers and Christmas decorations. While Daniel may not be with us now, he will forever receive love through other people just like he should have received when he was still with us. I came into this expecting it to be very hard for me, but I had to take many breaks for this one. I don't even have any like funny words. This one was just hard. Let, let's let's move on. Before we hop in the end segment though, I would like to thank my Tormented Knights and my Knighted Patreons. For my Tormented Knights, we have Andrea, EB Agent J, James, JJ, Nee. For my Knighted Patreons, we have Cherisee, Emma, Jessica, Kira, Lucas, Monkey Cool, Shizen, and Timo. Thank you guys so much. Your support genuinely does mean a lot and it allows me to bring you the quality content that you guys oh so desire. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed the video, why not like and subscribe? It definitely helps me out. If you didn't, though, why not dislike and let me know what I can improve on for next time. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I will see you all in the next one.